Guys, I'm so excited for this. Wade Lightheart and Matt Gallant, welcome to the Optimal Performance Podcast. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Love the name too, because uh, we've been on that journey for a long time. So uh, what is the quest for Optimum is 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 never ending. Yeah. Well, I want to dive directly into the book because this is both of your guys' return. You know, Wade, this is three for you. Matt, this is two for you here uh, on the OPP. And the book is coming out. And I, I, I'm so excited to talk about this because it, it goes to what you just said and alluded to there, Wade, which is this sort of uh, the process of optimization over time. And knowing your guys' backstory your two very different approaches to uh, nutrition um, and and diet, and the results speak for themselves in your not only in your output and what you you give to the world, but also in your physiques uh, as you know as you continue to to stay fit and strong. Um, if you would please give either of you could give me just sort of a cliff notes version of of what the title of the book is and how differently your guys' diets have been to, to come together to create this book. That'd be really helpful. Yeah. The book is called the ultimate nutrition Bible and it's how to easily create the perfect diet for you using your goals, psychology, and genetics. Of course, there's a lot more than that, but those are the, the primary things. And yeah, we really believe it's the most complete unbiased nutrition book that's ever been written. Wait. Yeah. I mean, there's a conversation that goes on outside of the podcast world. And so if I'm sitting at a table with a bunch of high performing experts, all the names that you hear about on all the podcasts, the, and, and we're being totally vulnerable, virtually every expert will say the same thing. There is a percentage of people, no matter how far down the zealotry of a diet or system they might be, that didn't respond. And it secretly drives that person crazy because most of those people are operating from that feel good space where they got the, the, the biochemical reaction of helping somebody transform their life. That's why they chose this career. That's why they did the research. That's why they overcame their own challenges. That's why they build a following because they love that value and they love that. But what drives us all bananas in the industry is the people that don't respond to that system, that fall outside the bell curve of response. We talk about that in the early chapters of how marketing convinces people, bell curve distribution of what diet's gonna be right for someone, what exercise system, et cetera. And so we're kind of taking that behind the scenes conversation amongst the world's best experts in their most vulnerable moments and using that as a platform to share how to transcend the dietary cult-like mentality and find what's right with you and not fall prey to being stuck in a paradigm that you'll never be successful in or that you cannot maintain success because it's suboptimal for who you are as a person, either psychologically, genetically, or if you want to change what you want to do as a goal. And, and just to hammer the, the point home, Wade and I were both dietary zealots. I've been doing keto now for almost 30 years. Wade's been doing a plant-based diet for 20 years. And we argued for probably a decade about which diet was superior. But as we got deeper and deeper, we realized that one, every diet doesn't work for everyone. And that's, uh, again, a truth that a lot of dietary zealots haven't realized or accepted yet. And two, that there's some universal dietary principles and optimizers that everyone can use to improve the performance and the results of their diets. So I'm hearing you say that this is that you've you've had you've had enough self exploration and enough sort of behind the scenes conversations with some of the world's leading experts in nutrition and gut health and sleep health, you know, sleep optimization and now have put together something useful for people the what i mean i i i'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around that because in my world that requires customization it requires a lot of times coaching 
It requires deep introspection and conversation to get to a point where you're like, okay, what do you want to do? What do your genetics say? What's available to you in the area that you live that you can cook and prepare food for? Here are some things you need to stay away from. You don't methylate properly. You're not getting enough sunshine. So the nutrition that you're eating isn't, you know, isn't turning on your mitochondria, et cetera. So to, to put it all into a book and say, okay, well, this is, this is how you do it. Even without that sort of coaching and one-on-one deep dive, I'm super curious about if maybe walk us through that, uh, that sort of healthy skepticism that I have. And I think listeners might have as well. Yeah, it's definitely a journey and a way that are still on this journey. Like there's always another level of optimization, but I think it'd be helpful to walk through the, what we call the hierarchy of nutritional decisions, like the pyramid that people should go through to design the ultimate diet for them. And the base of it, which very few people talk about is really kind of spiritual considerations. Now for a lot of people, this doesn't apply, but you know, I have friends that are Orthodox Jews. I have friends that are Muslims. There's a lot of vegans that choose to do that for spiritual considerations. So automatically, there are certain diets or types of foods that are just eliminated because of their spiritual beliefs. And we're not here to judge these people or tell them they're wrong. We're here to support them because even though the diet might not be the best diet for their genetics, there is ways to overcome that. Wade, any comments you want to add to that? Yeah, I I have um, one of my best friends is in the Hindu community, and I myself have really got into Eastern philosophy. And that was my first introduction into a completely plant-based diet. And I've noticed with many of my clients in that particular culture that they had some really tough challenges to overcome as far as maintaining body fat levels, because it just was too difficult socially or psychologically to break away from the pressures or values inside that system. So if you're trying to, you know, give a person a genetic test and saying, you know what, uh, you gotta, you gotta violate your entire family and social structure in order to maintain the diet. The likelihood of that person doing it is zero percent, and there's a sense of hopelessness that comes with that, or it's it doesn't work. The other thing is, is recently I was in Bosnia, and uh, we have a, a a lot of Muslims over there, and it was during Ramadan. And so I got to take part in the fasting part of Ramadan each day. And then together we would gather and they would introduce me to a variety of foods that I never ha- had before. And I really enjoyed embracing the values of the culture. It's not that I'm a Muslim. It's just that I appreciated the whole social aspect and how powerful that is for them, their culture, their community. And I think if you're avoiding that as a dietary expert, you're essentially chopping the person's values and identity out before that. And the likelihood of them succeeding for any length of time is pretty close to zero. And I don't hear anybody talking about those things. And especially when you're on social media and you're attacking, you know, vegans attacking carnivores, carnivores attacking vegans and stuff. What they fail to recognize is you're not just attacking a diet, you're attacking a person's culture and a person's identity. And we need to remove ourselves from that and have open conversations saying, oh, what is your culture? What is your values? What is the tendencies? Now let's work within that parameter. And there's some universal principles that Matt talked about, like, you know, depending on your outcome, building muscle or losing body fat, let's say it's a couple or longevity pursuits. Well, now we can start working and having a conversation about what we can do as opposed to proclamations about, you know, who you are and what you are, because those breed over and have nasty consequences. And, and, and the reality is this, 97% of people who start a diet, and let's say even if they're successful, will regress and gain the weight back because weight loss is probably one of the biggest ones. And nobody wants to talk about that. No, so as an industry, as experts, we have to own the fact that our entire industry has only created a 3% success rate. And we're owning that 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 fact that's a fact and we, we could all say oh well i've had 500 clients or 10,000 clients or a million clients that have followed my system and i'm the great guru or whatever that's a bunch of crap because the data says that's not true 
and let's address that uh, as responsible experts in the field. Any any follow up questions, Sean, or you want us to go to the second layer? That was just uh, layer one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got we've got three hours today, right, guys? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Afternoon's free. I'm good. No, let's go to the next layer because I've got notes that I want to follow up on. So yeah, let's continue. Yeah. So the second layer, and I think this is where probably the biggest blind spot is in general in the diet world, is the emotional psychological needs. Because if you think about you know, the failure rate that we just mentioned, which is 97%. Like, why is that? Okay, yeah, there's some physical reasons, but ultimately, if your nutritional strategy and also how you implement it is not aligned with your psychology and emotions, the odds that you stick with it long-term are pretty close to zero. So one of the first things we talk about has been something we've both worked on, worked on extensively has been becoming emotionally healthy. I'm friends, you know, I'm a recovered alcoholic and I'm friends with a lot of people in the program and alcoholics. And, you know, I'm also friends with a lot of food addicts. You know, they have, let's call them, you know, food issues and they use food as a drug, which is very real. I mean, from a bio, from a neurochemical perspective, if you go and binge on hedonic foods, sugary foods, deep fried foods, especially deep fried sugary foods, that's the ultimate uh, your dopamine serotonin levels just explode. And that's one of the reasons why people get hooked on it. And there's, a, there's some awesome data on using tools like EFT, you know, emotional freedom technique, also known as tapping, to improve, you know, to reduce cravings, to reduce cortisol and improve long-term results. So we're really big fans of, you know, processing out the traumas that might be driving a lot of emotional eating people are doing. So that's the first piece. Second piece is like, to thy own self be true. That's one of my favorite you know, sayings I've ever heard. And you know, to, see, to get to dive into the weeds, you know, what's your discipline style? And that's something that we've learned over time. For an example, some people are just dietary cyborgs. They're just wired that way. You know, they're they're able to be extremely disciplined. They feel good doing that. They're naturally wired that way. Both Wade and I are not wired that way. Even though Wade's been incredibly successful as a bodybuilder and gotten shredded, and it was kind of a, an epiphany because I used to think Wade was this dietary cyborg, but then we realized there's a second type of person which is obsessed with the purpose. And Wade, maybe you can talk about that because you know, you're, you're the best living example. I know of that. Yeah. So left to my own accords without an, an outcome that I see that ignites my soul for a greater purpose. I can't stick to a diet. I like, I just love to, I, I'll just go down. Like I, one of the running jokes, this is a, this is a secret joke that most people know, like my close friends do. I'm like, if we're in a social setting and somebody opens up a bag of chips and I don't care how big it is or opens up a bowl of chips, I will devour every one of them without even offering anybody. I just go into this mindless trance and I will eat. And it, it, you could have a 45 gallon pail of chips and I would do it because I, I just I love that. And I whatever that my neurochemistry goes crazy on it, the crunch, the salt, all that sort of stuff. However, if I've decided that. I've got a, for example, recently when I was doing my uh, Olympia press preparation. So I, I was, I was on a, a, a hardcore diet for 18 straight months. Didn't violate the tenets for 18 months. Didn't even have a break for 12, not one dietary break for 12. I'm not saying I recommend that for people, but I was on a purpose to prove a particular thing at 50 years old on a plant-based diet that I could do that, run a marathon, all that sort of stuff. So that was easy. The second, the second that's over, where's Wade? He's over to the chip bag. Now you could bring out that same bag, that same can of chips, pail of chips, bag of chips, whatever, in that time frame. And I was in all kinds of situations. I never felt any inclination that I'd have that. That's the power of understanding your values and emotional, psychological drivers. So if you have this, and we break this down in the book of how you can access your very own kind of like, you know, superpower, because it is a superpower. 
and I'm an emotionally driven guy. Matt's more a intellectually driven guy. I leverage my emotion and my energy and my power to allow me to be successful, even though I'm not disciplined. Matt needs the science. He needs the data before he's good. If he doesn't have the data, you know, I don't know, man, forget it. Like prove it to me. Let's see a double blind. Study. Let's see a triple blind. Let's see. I don't know how many blind studies you need for Matt, but, and, and then he's going to say, well, what about this? And what about like, even when he gets that, it's not enough. He's got to go another level and another level and another level. That's his thing. I'd go crazy that way. And so we can, you can imagine the arguments that Matt and I had. I mean, they were crazy. Like I always say, this book was 20 years of arguments and two years of writing uh, on, on how we resolve those arguments. That That's why, that's why I'm so excited to read it. And I think that because I, because again, I know your guys' background and your history and and so if i hear you correctly you actually give people what tools frameworks exercises um that, that they yeah. can do to tap into that psychological driver around their food intake yeah i mean again it's it's understanding who you are right to thy own self be true and just to add a little more color to what we just said you know there's four types of archetypes as far as complying with expectations. And as Wade alluded to, I'm a questioner. I need like all the questions that I have in my mind answered for me to comply with a strategy. Now, Wade is a rebel. So one, and this again was a really powerful insight. Wade loves to create really unique challenges for himself. So being plant-based and being a natural bodybuilder and competing is how he set up a, a situation for him to be, again, rebellious against what everyone else was doing. And again, Wade was doing this 20 years ago. And then, of course, there's upholders, which, you know, there's a certain psychological type. They like to, you know, they're more of a nurturing type. They like being around people. So being part of a group or being coached is really important. And there's obligers. So, again, just understanding that, understanding your neurochemistry understanding are you an emotional eater we, again we cover all of those and we have an entire chapter devoted to kind of psychological tactics and strategies as well as emotional strategies and tactics and again to me to us those things are just as important as all the other more scientifically nutrition driven variables that we'll get into in a second yeah, I, I want to get I want to go there but, but before we do and and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir, um, you and your audiences and, you know, the people that buy your products, the listeners of this podcast, um, are switched on, they're paying attention, right? They, they, they buy supplements, they understand what keto is, you know, they, maybe they test mm -hmm. their ketones, et cetera. Uh, at what point, how do you walk that fine line between being informed and making good choices that empower your best self to be fully optimized and obsessive compulsive disorder? Like, like, how do you, how do you write a book that that gives people all these tools and frameworks without it becoming like a neuroses? Mm. Well, I think Wade and I have certainly both had cycles of obsessive behavior. I mean, to be successful to the level Wade has in, in bodybuilding, there's a certain level of, of obsessive behavior you need to, to be at. And I'm in the same boat. I mean, I'm just naturally wired that way. But over time, I mean, for an example, I don't have an O-ring anymore. I mean, I tracked my sleep for like 10 years, you know, spent $45,000. We did a whole podcast on that, on optimizing my sleep. At, at this point, like there's not a lot of value. I wasn't even checking my dad anymore. And I lost a bunch of weight. My ring slipped off and I just never got a replacement. So yeah, I'm kind of on the other side of it. But at the same time, I'll go through kind of, obsessive cycles of, okay, I'm going to really optimize this. I'm going to dive into it. I'm going to get in, you know, buy a bunch of devices and get a bunch of data, like aging right now, reversing aging is like my current obsession. So yeah, I kind of cycle in and out of it. And I know that it's going to peter out at some point. Wade, how do you manage that? Yeah, for me, it goes through um, self-observation. So one of the things that maybe because I grew up uh, I call it in the pre-internet era, 
And largely with my early coaching, we had to become very highly attuned to what was going on physiologically within my own body. And so for me, data is secondary to what I intuitively feel. And I'm so confident with my own intuition that it allows me to be a rebel or appear to be a rebel inside a sea of opinion. And essentially, opinions are largely part what people are advocating. And that opinion is constructed out of a subset of experiences. But that subset of experiences are driven by the individual's predispositions anyway. So that's where the whole function of bias comes from. Now, the beauty, I don't think this book could have been created by a single person for that reason. The reason that we were able to create this book and what makes it so unique to maybe what's been out there before is that Matt's and I's whole functionality is almost completely opposite to each other. And yet we still have this passion to help people. And that's where our, that's where our, we were able to overcome our limitations, our biases, our patterns, our tendencies, and, um, and leverage each other's strengths and weaknesses. So I might be tuned into something intuitively, and there's some things that happened intuitively that were proven out decades later. And there are things that Matt have found research-wise that I was like, I never would have found, I, went, I wouldn't even expose myself to have an intuitive opinion. So without both of those areas, the, the areas outside of our range of observational capability or where we're gathering data, that's where the wins are. And that's where also all the conflict happens and why people become so polarized about, you know, which diet is going to give you this or what strategy is going to give you like, and, and what happens, it just becomes a cyclical bang the drum and it's my tribe versus your tribe. And what happens is we've been around long enough that we see the rise and fall of diet cults. And, you know, they come with a different name and they come with a couple of nuances and a new good looking fit advocate who's got all the answers and all the subcontent and, and, you know, and they're on the new medium, whether it's, you know, the old days in the infomercials, whether it was this, a group of CDs he got from the internet, was it the latest Instagram model now or the new podcast superstar? It's all the same thing repackaged over and over and over again. And, you know, you, I hang around with a lot of old guys because I'm on the backside of my uh, my first century on the planet. And, you know, we, we all laugh. It's like, yeah, I saw that back in 72. Then it came up again in 94. And here it is again in 23. You know, like so. And, and, and unfortunately, we have a lot of great young people in the industry right now that are really motivated, really passionate. They know more things than they ever have before but they're falling into the same trap. And we're hopeful that we're able to provide a set of tools and research that they can take their, their excellent knowledge and their passion for helping people in the world and expand and explode their influence because we got a mission here. Like the reality is the world is in trouble. People are really out of shape. People, the life expectancy is dropping. Modern medicine has got us as far as it can and people can't adhere to the best science. And it's because of the reasons that we've been able to identify from our own experiences. And that's what we want to share with people to help not just ourselves or not just our clients, but other experts. Because once they read this book, like someone like yourself, once you read this book, you're going, of course, that's it. Yes, that's it. And you're going to go back and those people that didn't fit in the philosophy, you're now going to be able to resolve those issues much more quickly. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next. Uh, next rung. Next rung, third, which is I think where most people start, which is goals. So in the book, we have essentially books within the book covering all five epic goals. Goal number one, weight loss, which has always been near and dear to my heart. One because I was a chubby kid, and two because I helped my best friend lose 191 pounds in 18 months when I was 19 years old. And that really got me on the journey. 
The second goal we cover is bodybuilding, muscle building, not necessarily bodybuilding, but just muscle building. And actually in the book, we share a program for free. It's included in the book that we used to sell for $300. And of course, Wade and I have both built 30, 40 pounds of lean muscle mass naturally over the years. So it's something we're very, very knowledgeable in. And we cover that third goal is athletic performance. And as a trainer, probably my favorite type of client uh, after weight loss clients was athletes. So I worked with a couple of professional athletes. So cover kind of the nutritional aspect of that. Fourth goal is cognitive optimization, which is definitely one of my personal obsessions. And the fifth goal is what we call biospan, which is health span and lifespan, right? Our goals are, I mean, my personal goal is to live to 170. We'll see if I make it. But, you know, with all the advancements that are happening in health, and technology, um, I, I think is doable and possible. So the goals completely shift everything, right? If your goal is muscle building, you need to be in a slight calorie surplus. If your goal is weight loss, you need to be in a calorie deficit. If your goal is athletic performance, you want to be around maintenance. If your goal is anti-aging or you know, basically trying to live longer, then you want to be slightly below maintenance. So all every goal completely changes your calories and macros, which is the fourth tier. So whether I'm an overweight Muslim or a 19-year-old stud baseball player, I'm, there's going to be ideas in the book and frameworks around psychology that are specific to the goals that I have. Is that right? Yeah, there's, there's something literally for everyone. I mean, if you have any interest in nutrition, there is something for you in this book, no matter what your goal is. Yeah, I think another important thing is it helps you ask the right questions within your given outcome. Because it's not the things that you know that screw you up. It's the things that you don't. For example, I'll give you a, a, a personal situation. And this was the genesis of our company. In 2003, when I did the Mr. Universe contest, after the contest, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks because I didn't know the concept of reverse dieting. I also didn't know the value of your microbiome in that. 2003, not a lot of people are talking about it. We found a doctor. That doctor taught us about the microbiome, the role of enzymes and probiotics and you know, your diet was only as good as how good your gut health was. And I was like, oh, I didn't know reverse dieting. I didn't know. Like if you go on an extreme and you talk to bodybuilders of the past, they all would go from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. That's what I did. And so today, when you talk to the very top athletes, like my friend, uh, Natalia Coella, who's the current Miss Olympia getting ready to defend her title this year. Someone asked her in a webinar, like, well, how do you like, what do you eat on your cheat meals? And she's like, what are you talking about? I never cheat. So her psychology is uniquely capable of it. She doesn't go. She says, I can't go out of shape because she prides herself in being shaped. She knows that on the level of rigidity, she's operating to be the world's best. She has to work within a much tighter framework than someone who's doing a contest every few years or, uh, you know, doing a weight lot or weight cut to get in shape for a wedding or something like that. But if you get in shape for your wedding, how do you come out of that while maintaining your weight without gaining it all back? Because most people will gain it all back. And you can learn about that in the book and have that strategy. And, you know, Matt identified this, and I thought it was a brilliant identification where he said, the strategy after you hit your goal weight is equally or more important than the strategy to get there. And, and that was a massive mind blower for me because being a person who naturally doesn't have discipline, like, I, like I'm the first guy to the buffet table after the contest is over, right? Like it's over, you know, I'm done. And, and that was an area that I struggled with. Okay. Let's right, keep going. Fort, um, fort level, fort level um, calories, and, calories and macros, which is essentially where I, like every diet book is about. And as we had mentioned earlier, people create a new variation of the ketogenic diet or a new variation of if it fits your macros. But ultimately, you know, the, the macros are are the macros. And of course, calories depends on your goals. 
it is important to identify that the top two, the most important macros in on any diet is protein and fiber. Um, and again, especially on a plant-based diet, fiber is is king and whey is probably the king of fiber. But protein is the king macronutrient on any diet. It doesn't matter if it's muscle building, weight loss. And it, just to go a, a little bit deeper, the real goal and the real purpose of protein is amino acids. And that's why we've been using mass science for 20 years because it literally turns protein into a, a pool of amino acids and peptides in about 30 minutes. We just did the test in the lab on that. So yeah, calories and macros obviously is where most people live, but that's it. I mean, and and yes, that's important, but all these other elements that we're covering are equally as important. Wait, you want to talk about fiber? Because again, we just competed, won a, a California natural bodybuilding show, then competed at the natural Mr. Olympia in Vegas and you know, you, you pushed fiber to, I think the highest levels you ever did before on any dietary game plan. Yeah. So, you know, the, one of the things I think bodybuilders are the original biohackers. They don't get enough credit for it because they're coming, overcoming two evolutionary tendencies. One to build a disproportionate amount of muscle and two to reduce their body fats to significantly lower levels. But from a longevity perspective, the bodybuilding community doesn't have good marks. Well, why is that? So here are people that are consistently in a sub-calorie model, but they're building extra muscle. Why do they not live long? And, and they follow mostly if it fits your macros, which is very effective on a performance diet. And most people, you know, going back to that rebel idea, you know, the rebel psychology, people told me 20 years ago, you can't win a bodybuilding contest on a on a plant-based diet, there's not enough protein. You can't get enough protein. And protein has a one of the big benefits on a dietary side is satiety. It allows you to stay fuller longer. Well, Matt and I learned to optimize the amino acid delivery on a substandard level of protein from a bodybuilding perspective. So under normal conditions, I would be eating 200 to 250 grams of protein a day on a typical bodybuilding diet. That's virtually impossible on a plant-based diet. So how was I able to eat 100 grams of protein, but still get the amino acids to recover and have the satiety? And the answer to that question is fiber, because fiber has an equal, if not extended, I think it might even be superior to protein on a satiety level. I became famous for the big ass salad. And, you know, I, I would go to the store. It's still today. I go I go to Whole Foods or something. I walk in the cell. People go, oh, my God, are you going to eat all that? It's like, is that what you're like? And I have this massive salad every day. And because I'm a type of person that likes to eat and likes to eat a lot, I have that big salad. And it keeps me saturated in a calorie de deficit. Now, our enzymes and probiotics and our whole digestive system allowed me to extract more amino acids out of the 100 grams of protein I'm consuming than a bodybuilder eating 250 grams of meat and eggs and, you know, uh, protein powders and things like that. It's not what you eat. It's what you digest, absorb and utilize. So I optimized my digestive health, my capacity to bring amino acids in to recover my body. I created satiety factors with the fiber that offset my tendency for food cravings and the fiber kept my blood sugar in like a ketogenic level. When they, when I do a homo IR test, people think I'm on a ketogenic diet, even though I'm eating carbs regularly, I have a low protein diet and high fiber. So it's completely the opposite model, but it's not if you understand the nuances. That, that's, that still blows my mind. I, yeah, the next level. I, again, I, I, so many questions, but next level, <laughs> next level, I Matt. Mean, this, this book is five hundred and forty pages. So yeah, there's a ton of content. I mean, it took us again, like, like three years to put this together. But yeah, the next level is a new science, and it's called nutrigenomics. So nutrigenomics is the science of how nutrition and our genes interact, and. Again, it's definitely a new emerging science, but there's some really powerful nutrigenomic kits and systems, and we're, we're going to be offering one uh, very, very soon, that allow you to get really powerful game-changing insights that can explain why, one, certain diets or certain aspects of a diet don't work for you, and I'll, get, I'll give you a personal example in a second, 
or which diet you should follow or not follow. So just to, to share some personal examples, you know, saturated fats, again, I, I've been a huge consumer of saturated fats since I'm 16 years old. That was when I got on a ketogenic diet. And I found out not that long ago that I don't have great genetics for saturated fats. And it was showing up in my lipid tests. So just that insight, I'm like, okay, let me drop my saturated fat. I'm, I'm consuming more olive oil, more macadamia nuts. So I'm still on a ketogenic diet, but I'm modifying it in a way that's more powerful and healthy for me. Another insight was I don't have great genetics for selenium. So I took my Brazil nut intake from one a day to two a day. So those are just simple examples, but Wade's got another great example. There's a reason why Wade eats a big ass salad because his nutrigenomics validated that, which, you know, of course, Wade's been doing that intuitively, but it, it was validated through nutrigenomics. Go ahead, Wade. Yeah, a couple examples, for example, um, I have suboptimal genetics for cardiovascular health. I have two bad genes. And the other thing is I have suboptimal genetics for blood sugar regulation. Okay, so early on in my career, when I went to a fits your macros bodybuilding diet, I was able to do protein, carbohydrates, and I have suboptimal genetics for fat metabolism. So I never did well on fats. So I was eating protein and rice cakes and getting ripped to shreds because I metabolize carbs, no problem. I can eat carbs all day long. I feel good on carbs. I feel energizing. In fact, I don't have carbs. I, I have, I don't feel good. So, but I, I never liked that diet because I was riding this spike. You know, I was using the simple carbohydrates to drive the amino acids at the expense of my microbiome. I didn't know this back then. So I looked good and I felt like crap. So when I went to a plant-based diet, I felt better, but couldn't get enough protein. So it, and that was the previous solution. Now, if I looked at my, my genetics from a cardiovascular perspective, uh, a high animal protein diet with slow digesting carbs and low body fat, a traditional type bodybuilding diet would be optimal for me on a performance side. The challenge would be is... When I get 70 or 80, those animal fats could be problematic and trigger the suboptimal genes that creates a, a stroke or a cardiovascular event. And I have a whole history of family members that are do that. So I was like, okay, well, plant-based diets are good in that, but plant-based diets are suboptimal for blood sugar regulation. And that's where the big ass salad came in because the big ass salad stabilizes my blood sugar throughout the entire day. I feel great. I can flip, you know, when I travel, I can go off at, go into a fasting cycle for two, three days without eating and feel totally fine. I do boost myself with some nootropics uh, because that makes my cognitive health better. And I feel fantastic. I have no problem traveling. I don't have the time lag issues, things like that. So even within what's suboptimal, these are not death sentences. When you have the information in this book, you're going to know, oh, I need to get this expert and I can offset triggering the suboptimal aspect of my genetics. And I think that's another area that that's emerging and we're identifying it. Here's the questions you need to ask so you can fit the diet within your hierarchy of values inside your psychological structure, yet still not make genetic mistakes that take you out of the game too early. I think that's great. I'm, I'm thank goodness. I don't, don't think that I missed what you said about offering coming soon uh, with nutrigenomics because I my I, I perked up. I, I, it does seem early, you know. I, I I've had coaching around, you know, my twenty three and me and and suggestions, and it never really stuck. It never really, it never really resonated with me. It wasn't specific enough, you know. Just like you know, you take the Viome test, and it's like, well, more fiber and legumes and nightshades might be problematic for you. It's like this generic information over and over. And so it's nice to know. I'm, I'm stoked that you guys are getting involved. We'll, we'll have to stick around for more. How, how many, how many more levels are there, Matt? 500 pages you got. Are there, are there... There's, there's four more levels. So let's just kind of fly through these. And again, these are just like the finer points back to what you mentioned earlier. You know, the fundamentals, which we've covered are, are the core things, but next we have gut biome, which you just, alluded to. So yeah, gut biome tests are helpful. You can find that you, you might have certain bacteria 
that allow you to thrive on certain types of food and struggle on other types. However, your gut biome is incredibly dynamic. I mean, we're constantly running experiments on probiotics. We've probably done over a thousand probiotic tests in the last three years in our lab. So your pro, your gut biome is evolving like literally meal by meal. I mean, if you fast for 48 hours, as an example, and I'm, and I'm on day five of a fast right now, your gut biome starts drying up. A lot of colonies will actually die. And you know, but bacteria is a 48 hour lifespan typically. So it's very malleable. So again, gut biome, the good news is if you have gut issues, you can fix them relatively fast. The next level is supplements, which again, we could do a whole podcast on that. We have, of course, Wade and our co-founders of Bioptimizers, and we do create best in class supplements. And I think the main point with supplements is there's certain people that just want to get everything from food. Unfortunately, it's just not possible. You know, there's not enough nutrients, first of all, in foods. You know, due to modern farming, due to pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, like even if you go buy organic food, it's still being sprayed with pesticides. So there's just, there's just not a lot of nutrients in food. And second of all, back to nutrigenomics, everyone has mutations. Now, I know mutation sounds like a big, scary word, but back to like selenium for me, I need more selenium than the average person. So it's helpful for me to know that, that I can make the, the dietary adjustments by just doubling up on my Brazil nuts. The la the third one, or sorry, the eighth one is food and allergies, which this is another big issue in the food space. There's too much fear mongering. People say, oh, nightshades is evil. Kale is evil. Oat milk is evil. All these things are just evil. People get so paranoid about food that they're scared to go buy anything. I mean, if you just spend four or five hours watching nutritional videos on Instagram, you'll be scared to go to the grocery store and, and buy anything. I mean, it's just the fear that's being propagated is just not healthy and it's way overblown. You know, are there certain people that might have issues with oxalates from kale? Maybe it's a small percentage. If you way overdo it, I mean, if you're pounding kale, every day for months and months, maybe, you know, same thing with lectins. And there's been a lot, there's been a lot of people that have come out with nutrition books that have used these, again, food allergies and sensitivities and made it sound like everybody should be highly concerned. But again, it's an individual thing. So some people might have problems with certain things, but again, it's just way overblown. And the last one, is lifestyle. And I think you know, once you achieve your final form, and I'll use exercise as a great example, it only takes about 33% of the exercise volume to, to, that it takes to build muscle to maintain it. And it's the same thing psychologically, like the amount of mental energy somebody needs to spend to lose weight is quite high. But once you achieve your final form and you want to just maintain it, it's relatively easy. And again, I'm a foodie. I love traveling and enjoying great food. And I can do that. I mean, I've done, a, I just did three weeks in Europe a couple months ago with my family. And I came back and I lost weight. Did I diet? I wasn't dieting. I was just, and we, we have a whole chapter on all the tactics and things you can do um, to enjoy your favorite food, go to fine dining and not gain body fat, not gain weight. So, yeah, I think when we're talking about being successful for life, that final piece, like the peak of the pyramid, is making sure that whatever your lifestyle is, it's aligned with your diet. You still have some mental vigilance. You're still following some sort of structure. You're not, you know, off and doing whatever you want, but that you know you're enjoying life. I think it's really important. Wait, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think that's the the other piece to the book. I think which is people are going to really love, regardless of the diet that they're on. We have all these chapters of how to be successful on every diet, how to be successful in all of these different stations, situations. So situational tactics relative to the overall strategy you're applying. And we've got those, you know, over the course of our careers, which, you know, I started this whole journey when I was around 15, same as Matt. So we've got a, a lot of combined experience and a lot of people from a wide variety of social paradigms, you know, from, old people to young people, to people with weight gain issues, people with weight loss issues. And 
you need to understand your own individuality and that's the tactic that's right for you at the right time. So what diet's right for you? What diet's right for you right now? And what's diet's right for you in the future and how to tactically move within that diet or to some other aspect that allows you to have maximum amount of success, success with minimum amount of friction. That was the, that's definitely one of the little snippets that I'll put at the very beginning of the episode. Those last like six sentences was just so tight. So nice. I I had this sort of vision of, of the future of nutrition um, that makes things customizable, uh, more affordable because maybe psychologically you got to a point where you don't feel like you need to eat so frequently, you know, maybe you, maybe you can eat less calories. You can, you can use, use your hard earned money on really high quality supplements and nutrition, um, to help your gut and spend less on, you know, really expensive, high quality food because you're just eating less of it. Um, you know, deploying all of these techniques in a way where in, in, in my mind, it's like, you're making choices. If you're obese, you're making choices that are putting your body there. You may have some, dis- obviously you may have some metabolic dysfunction and some trauma and some, all, all this stuff, but the tools are all there, right? And just as you guys have been alluding to is that there is just this hurricane of information and fervor and kale went from the darling of, of the, you know, the, the best food on the planet to now it's just like, the bastard child of every keto. I mean, it's just so hilarious. And and now I'm starting to get it too. As I get a little bit older, I see these tricks and trends and Atkins now carnivore type of type of connections. And, you know, one, one question that I have is, is what was the hardest part for the two of you to rectify, to come together on, to come to some sort of cohesive collaboration around? I think it was realizing that there's no diet that's going to work for everyone. Like that's, that was the aha moment for me. I can't speak for weight, but I remember like I was putting all my clients, I mean, both Wade and I, we were very successful personal trainers. That's how we met. I was putting all my clients in a ketogenic diet. Now, probably about 80% were getting incredible results, but I remember my first couple of clients that, it just didn't work. I mean, one guy looked like he was gray. He lost a bunch of weight. It just didn't look healthy. And I just didn't understand why another guy was having trouble digesting fats and was having digestive issues. And I was baffled. I just didn't understand. And again, I was too, too dogmatic to see the truth. And the other side of it is I, I, like every diet can work for a while. And we cover that in the book. And that's you know, that happens, right? People switch diets and then they feel better because maybe they patch some nutritional deficiencies. It's new, but then over maybe three months, six months, and they don't feel good anymore because of all the variables we talked about. Wade, what was kind of the light bulb moment for you? Yeah, I would say similarly, only I would put it this way. What we were able to witness is an adaptive response that would happen in that 12-week cycle that was very positive. Motivation in the individual was high. Maybe the shift, the, the the body's metabolic response and addressing those nutritional issues, we'd see those results. And typical studies, research papers, they all will, very few of them are long-term. And none of them, or virtually none of them, apply for genetic variants or psychological variants. Okay, so you already, the the, the data is corrupt. And in the real world, When we start trading aspects, we started to realize, man, you know, there's some real holes here. When I tried a ketogenic diet, I I would hit a certain level of fats and I get fat in my stool. And I'm like, I'm not absorbing this. And then Matt said, well, you know, him being motivated to win the argument, went out and started studying fat enzymes and discovered, well, there's four different fat enzymes that you require in order to metabolize the fats. Well, he developed a product around a uh, ketogenic diet, like a ketogenic product to help people like myself that wasn't suited for that. Well, I took this product and all of a sudden I could up my fats twice as much as I could before. And I didn't have fat in my stool. I was like, oh, okay. 
there's this lipolytic enzyme, these four different types of lipids, not one, there was four different ones. Now I'm able to increase my fats. Now the benefit of having better fats in my diet was translatable into cognitive health, skin health, all these other areas that were limited in the diet that I, that I currently had. And so I was like, wow, what else don't I know? What else am I being biased in my paradigm with? Probably like hundreds of things. And that's when our diet went from arguments to discussions. And the discussion had one key element. What's the truth? Not, can I be better than you? Can I prove you? I want to argue vigorously or experiment rigorously. But in not in a way that I want to prove somebody wrong. I want to get a closer approximation of the truth because everything's a model. None of it is, there's no absolutes in the human condition because we're in an, a dynamic changing environment. Our bodies are dynamically changing over time as we age. So pretty much what's worked for you for the last 20 years probably isn't going to work for you for the next 20 because you haven't addressed these aspects that are missing in your diet. And sometimes those things don't show up for 10, 15, 20 years later. When a stressful situation in it comes in, it triggers that epigenetical response, that suboptimal genetic goes wiring. We've all heard of the person who was the healthiest person you ever knew and dropped dead suddenly. Nobody knew why. Well, what was why is because what they didn't know. And that's what we want to try to illuminate mm -hmm. for people. Wow. Well, well, we'll end here for the sake of time. And I'm not going to ask my typical last question, which is the fill in the blank question. Everyone would benefit from knowing. So instead of asking that, um, I've heard that you can't please everyone. So who is this book for? I think this book will please everyone except the <laughs> zealots. The zealots are going to hate us, but we're we're not here to fight the zealots. We're here to get them out of their their dogmatic uh you know black holes that they're trapped in so hopefully they'll, they'll come in we're seeing that right i mean we're seeing guys like dr paul saladino who was a carnivore zealot for an example he's eating honey and some other things so even the zealots i think over time will convert but i think it is for everyone i really do i think there's literally again no matter what your goal is if you're a biohacker and you want the latest bleeding edge science on nutrigenomics and gut health and weight loss, it's it's in there. And if you're somebody who's been struggling to lose weight, again, we literally have about 200 pages of content almost de devoted to every aspect of weight loss. We have a muscle building system. We have the athletic performance. So I do think it's for everyone except the zealots. And even the zealots will benefit from reading it. So. They need it probably more than any, anyone else. Yeah, the zealots will get a dose of nuance. I like that. <laughs> Guys, we managed to pack in a ton of information. Um, unsurprisingly, you guys have delivered. I can't wait to read the book. Uh, and and I, just when you think you can you know it all, you find out you know nothing. <laughs> and, you know, for me with my goals, and I think the, the goals of my listeners who want to, they want to be, strong. They want to have lots of energy. They want to sleep well. They want to live a really optimal life. They want to be the best versions of themselves that they can. That does lead toward, you know, pretty rigid thinking about what they're putting in their body. And so hopefully this will be, uh, be a solution for everybody. So where should, uh, where should everybody go to find it? Ultimate nutrition system.com forward slash OPP. And the code is OPP 10 the 10% off. And we did also spend a week in Hollywood, in the Hollywood Hills, filming a video course of all the content, which you'll also be able to, to grab with the book. So literally, it, it's beautifully shot. I mean, beautifully edited. Um, it, it's kind of a, a little bit, I'm not going to say dumbed down, but you know, summarized a little more. But yeah, it's about 25 hours of video content. So if you prefer video, then we got that. Of course, the book's there as well. Awesome. Gentlemen, Wade, Matt, thank you so much for joining me today on the Optimal Performance Podcast. Great to Thanks be here, man. Us. Thank you. Thank you.